our speakers tonight really don't need much of an introduction. Um, who better to speak about maple sugaring in Conway than uh, a Boyden and a brunette? Um, so Howard is an eighth generation, right? Conway? In Conway, yeah. In Conway. Um, yep. And his family settled in Conway in 1761. Does that sound right? Three. I believe. Three. I believe. 63. Okay. <laughs> you don't remember? Yeah. <laughs> Cyrus, Cyrus Rice came in 62 and we came along the following year, early in the uh -huh. year. The first child born in Conway was a, was a boy. Was a boy. Yeah. You knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill, your family came in about 1781, is yes. that right? And you're also eighth generation. Yes, we are. Conway. Um, and both your families have produced syrup for a very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill's, Bill's family a little bit longer. And he'll get started with the with the history of, of the Burnett Maple. <laughs> well, I know we'll learn a lot tonight. So Bill Burnett and Howard Boyden, let's give them a warm welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I just wanted to give you a little history about our farm first. Um, we came from Scotland, and Robert Burnett was the first one that came over here. And he was actually kidnapped by the British, put on a man of war ship to be a doctor in the in the States. And he apparently jumped ship in either Tiverton, Rhode Island, or New Bedford, Mass. And he then ended up in Sutton, I believe, married, had three children. Then his wife died. He got remarried and had four children and ended up in Warwick, Mass. And his son Archibald was a one that bought our farm in Conway in 1781. And we've been there ever since and doing a variety of different farming with you know, dairy and, and beef and sugaring, firewood, uh, some of everything. Sheep, they had a big sheep production in many years ago. Say so how large the farm was back then. What's that? Say so how large the farm was back then. I think it was 55 acres to begin with, but it grew to over a thousand acres. And then it's now down to 300 acres. So, and so, and then Howard, I'll let you tell about yep. your family coming here. Yeah, okay. Before we go any further, I have to uh, introduce this rose between two thorns <laughs> here. And this is Bill's sister, Debbie. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Debbie, uh, Debbie put together some of the history uh, for tonight, and, and she's been involved forever. But yeah, been doing it for a long time. So my family uh, yeah, came to Conway in 1763. My oldest ancestor, Jonathan Boyden, came over as an indentured servant uh, back around uh, very, very early in the 1700s and uh, worked his way out of indenturement and uh, became actually became a select board uh, chair in the town of Groton, Mass. and. His grandson Josiah is the one that uh, that actually moved out here, and a first of not the first of there was a long line of Josiah Boydens. The <laughs> Boydens are kind of funny in that respect. They seem to really like that name. So um, we have, this, as close as we could come was a Joshua. We just didn't yeah. couldn't, we couldn't make ourselves do that. So anyway, the the original Boyden family land was out by Roaring Brook. So you'd have to continue out Roaring Brook Road, and they, I believe, followed Roaring Brook up into Conway. Buying land as they headed north and selling the land behind them until they landed where the farm is right now. And uh, basically, what they were looking for was something that wasn't quite as hard scrabble and something that was farmable. And it was all forested when they got there, and I remember uh, stories my grandfather used to tell, that his grandfather used to tell that the chestnut trees were so big that you could ride a horse under them and see the lay of the land. And so it just goes to show you how quickly Conway turned from a extremely old growth forested land into almost 100% cleared land in the, in the span of about 100 years. Uh, so and an awful lot happened on that land and a lot of it is a lot of things are still happening now um, So basically Once they got to where they are we kind of been there and the big White house at the farm was inhabited by 
two Boyden families, my great-grandfather Josiah and his brother Charles. And Charles's family was on the north side of the house and Josiah's family was on the south side of the house. And, and it really, to this day, you can walk in that house and you can see how it is a giant duplex. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just one grand staircase uh, from Rarnbrook Road going up the middle of it and hallways with rooms on either side of it, um, kitchens on both sides giant chimneys that must have sucked up cords and cords and cords of wood <laughs> to just barely survive. Um, the house had central heat in it, a steam boiler in the cellar, until for one of the wars they needed the iron and they came and took all the radiators. <laughs> and uh, it went back, to, went back to wood stoves and fireplaces until central heat wasn't put in again until I was about, oh gosh, 35 years old, we put a boiler in and, and put uh, central heat back in the house. So it was, uh, it was a lot of years of, of shivering in the winter and sitting close to the stove. Some of us still do that. Yes, some of us still do that. And you probably have a rocking chair not too far from it. You know, that's what I remember about every wood stove seemed to be married to a, ro a rocking chair. And uh, you go in in the winter, you could see why. In my house, um, does not still have a furnace. I have a pellet stove, so it kind of takes a lot of it. Yeah. I don't have to worry quite as much about, about getting up in time. But there's not a fireplace in our house, in the, yeah. in the farmhouse. It's yeah. like it was always wood stoves. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so then along comes maple, and the Burnett's actually have been doing maple in Conway a bit longer than the Boydens from the best I can tell. So, Bill, you want to pick up where you guys, as, as, as far back as you can reach in your history right. for maple. As far as I know, I, I've got a, it's over here, a probate record of Lionel Burnett to Willis Burnett. And listed in there were sap buckets and maple sugaring equipment. And the prices were like $1.67 for 35 buckets or something like that. <laughs> but that was passed on from father to son. And that was 1860. So it was 1830s, 1840s that we can figure they were, were making maple syrup at that point. And we all know that we didn't just pick up and doing this. We learned from the way the Native Americans had done it. And there's a little thing here that my, Debbie's- My favorite little legend about how, because it had to have been an accident. Oh, I gotta find it. And it said that, an old Indian legend said that maple syrup was discovered as a result of a quarrel between a squaw and her brave. The lady of the wigwam asked her husband to fill a cooking pot with water. Ugh, said the disgruntled brave, who left the teepee in a huff, put a pot near a maple tree, and vented his wrath by slashing the bark with his tomahawk. The next day, the squaw found the pot filled with liquid. She took it back to her tent, boiled some venison in it, and made the first maple syrup. So, I mean, it had to have been an accident. Well, my grandfather was splitting firewood years ago, probably a four-foot diameter old maple tree. It was just died and was going to make firewood out of it. And in the process of splitting wood up for firewood, he came upon this stick of wood with looks to be hatch marks in the tree. Oh. And so whether it was made by Native Americans or early settlers that had learned from the Native Americans. Oh. But that's a, a pretty unique stick of wood. Yeah. We always wondered, how in the world did he find that? He could have just thrown it in the wood pile, you know, we never would have noticed it. In more recent years, we came upon this tree where it's split in firewood. And you can see where the drill had tapped into the tree to get the sap out. The hole where the drill was never filled in, it was a void inside the tree. You can see where it healed on the outside and the tree kept growing out. And that happened the same with that wound there from, from the tomahawk or hatchet. Wow. Like I said, we learned the Native American ways. Um, here's a collection of different spouts over the years. You know, they had wooden buckets when they started doing the buckets. They didn't bring a bucket. Well, I didn't either. I figured everybody's seen a wooden set bucket. Yeah. <laughs> these were hand-whittled sticks of willow or wood with the groove in it, and they'd put in the tree and then go into the bucket. Produce on down to the, the metal ones where you hung buckets on, they got the hook built right into them. Down through to the plastic for the, for the tubing that most everyone's using now. And 
all the changes of, of that time. Nineteen forty seven, the Berkshire Pioneer Maple Producers Association was formed. And my dad was a founding member of that, along with all the other area producers that were involved in it. The old timers. And <laughs> they um, organize all the producers and everything to work together and get, promote the maple syrup. But back in the time, no one knew Mass Massachusetts made maple syrup. All the sugar houses were back in the woods next to the sugar trees. And my dad became president, and he felt that Massachusetts needed to be recognized. And so he uh, decided to build our sugar house next to 116 and open it to the public so people could see how it was done. And it's been recorded that we were the first ones in the state to set up next to the road. And then the Goulds, the Davenports, uh, Lachures all end up building, you know, and everybody the else yep. in the woods <laughs> and everyone else around. So that's, you know, one thing that my dad was just felt that he needed to, to get it out in the public. So he said maple syrup, and they said Vermont. You know, nobody even knew Massachusetts did it. So, and we were mobbed. I mean, because people once they heard about it, and we used to get a lot of people from Westover when it was active. And you know, they'd all come back and you know, we had kids that came in as little bitty kids and came back twenty years later with their kids. So it was it was a lot of fun seeing different people year after year after year. So we started with the evaporator that was in the old sugar house that was back up in the woods. I think I believe it was a three by ten evaporator. And they used that for a couple years, bought a new evaporator. And I wrote the price down for three hundred and thirty-two dollars for a complete <laughs> evaporator. Four by twelve. No, that was a three that by was ten. Another three by ten. Three by ten. Okay. And that was in nineteen fifty-four, the second year they were making syrup in, next to the road. And we ran that one until nineteen sixty-one, when we bought the current one, which is a four by twelve, four feet by twelve feet. And that one was nine hundred ninety-two dollars. <laughs> so, and we're still, when we finished boiling it in that location. We were still using that evaporator, but the pan had sprung a leak and to replace one of the pans was the last price we had was nine thousand three hundred dollars. Oh my god. <laughs> so we at that point proceeded to start selling sap to the Boydens. <laughs> point point of interest. Four years ago I bought a brand new four by twelve evaporator for thirty three thousand oh, dollars. So, so that's 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 what they cost now. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the tubing and buckets of comparison? Yeah, Warren Harris, we, he set buckets. We kind of did it a joint thing, but Warren did all the gathering. And he was getting old, decided he was going to retire, and tubing was the way to go. So we started tubing in like 1975, Five. 76. And so Warren was still doing buckets, and we had some buckets and the tubing and everything. So all of a sudden we started, I started looking around or noticing, and it came up that, um, the tubing, in 1977, the buckets ran that year, they ran 5.3 gallons of sap per tap, because I kept track of everything. And the tubing was 10.8 gallons per tap. Wow. And then in 1981, which everybody that sugared remembers 1981. I don't have buckets that year, because I don't think Warren was doing them. Anyway, our tubing ran 15.81 gallons of sap per tap. And a lot of it went on the ground because it was running, we've got 800 to come in on one line on, up at the farm. There was seven and a half gallons of sap a minute. It was like 45 gallons to one. So, you know, every six minutes we had enough sap to make a gallon of syrup. And the best we could do was like four barrels an hour. And it was, it was just running over every day. It was, it was so, you know, we had every leaky tank full of sap. And it's like we couldn't begin to keep up with it. So I have no clue how much it really ran, but it was just unbelievable that year. Yeah, 1981, we made, where is that? Right there. 1980, we had 2,617 taps out, buckets and tubing. We made 265 gallons of syrup. That is 0.1 gallons per tap, averages a quart to bucket, so a quart of a gallon. And in 1981, we had 2,004 taps. We made 726 gallons, which was 0.36 gallons per tap. And again, how much rain on the ground, we have no clue. 
But, and the year my dad died, everyone was like, you're not going to sugar. We made 512 gallons of syrup that next year, so <laughs> we were so proud of ourselves. I'll let you tell us so, about the improvements. So, yeah, enhancements. It, when I, uh, we'll go back a ways here, as far as I could go for sugaring on the farm. And, uh, you know, I always thought my grandfather Boyden was the first one that made maple syrup on the farm, Clarence. And uh, I found out he was the first one to make maple syrup. But his father, Josiah, my great-grandfather, actually made sugar, maple sugar, to sell in cakes. And it, I'll just read this letter here. This was a letter to Cynthia Graves Cranston from her aunt Grace. Grace McCoy grew up on the north side of the house, um, <laughs> sister, sister to Gladdy Graves. And this is, this is the letter that she wrote. Dear Cynthia, your mother wrote asking a few questions about sugaring in the days past. I'm enclosing a few snapshots that might help more than my words. Would like them back. <laughs> they put two spouts to a bucket. No covers on the buckets. When it rained, we had to empty the buckets. They carried the sap from gathering tub to a pan on the arch. Sometimes there was more sap than the pan, in parentheses, heavy tin, I think, would hold. So as sap boiled away, they added more. They couldn't boil the sap quite to syrup in that pan. It took two to four men to lift the pan and pour the syrup through a heavy felt strainer into a big pail, probably 25 gallons or so, and another fellow put tin metal roofing over the arch so it wouldn't burn the sugar house down while this was happening. <laughs> Know about that. A pail of water was kept at the ready to pour into the pan for rinsing, and then when the fire was out, the pan was set up against the wall of the sugar house. Syrup was taken to the house for finishing, another locally made pan there. Syrup was boiled down to cake sugar. Sometimes were round, some were square, some were scalloped, turned bottom side up on a big board on the table. The size of the cakes varied, seven or eight cakes per pound. And there's, I've got a few molds up here. You can come by and look. And these were the tin molds that they actually poured the stirred hot syrup into to make the candy. We sold to stores, Hawks and Hassel, the two stores, and by the pound. They liked the cakes small as they could sell them by the cake at a time because some people couldn't afford a pound. I remember we had an order for 20 pounds from to Missouri every year, a person who used to live in Conway. Don't know how many buckets we set. There were 100 metal ones and a pile of wooden ones. Hope I've helped you. Did you feel the earthquake? We sure did. We got another <laughs> snow yesterday. So this was written along about 1980 at some point. Um, but that and talking with Cynthia and what she recalls from previous conversations lets me believe that it was actually Josiah Boyden that made the first maple on the farm, not Clarence. But Clarence bought the evaporator in 1927 and started producing maple syrup instead of hard sugar. It was no longer a batch process. An evaporator works as a continuous process, sap coming in all the time if all goes well, and syrup, <laughs> syrup coming out a little at a time and a lot of wood under the fire. And, uh, and that's, um, that was basically my recollection and from what my father had told me about maple syrup on the farm. But indeed, cake sugar was made before then by my great-grandfather, who, point of interest, was while they were installing the evaporator in 1927, he fell from the rafters of the sugar house from putting up the smokestack, cut his head on a nail, and later died of tetanus. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, so Ma Maple took a fairly heavy toll with the family. Um, my grandfather always never would say, Maple pays the taxes, Maple buys the groceries, he always said, Maple gets the men and horses in shape for summer. <laughs> and it, it, it was true. The, the old farmers never put all their eggs in one basket. Exactly. Maple was just one thing that helped them get through. 
And, um, you know, they raised apples. They um, eventually turned to a commercial dairy, uh, sold, sold apples, sold hay, sold lumber, uh, sold logs. You know, that's just what they did. But to this day, dollar in for dollar out, you best love making maple because <laughs> it's not the most profitable in the world. I'll tell you what, dollar in for dollar out, Christmas trees has got maple beet hands down. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if the sugar house burns tomorrow, I'll be making maple syrup in the spring. But if my Christmas trees all get caught by a blight or something and I never see another one, I won't look back. <laughs> Maple is in our veins oh, and we can't help ourselves. Uh, it's just something we're going to do. Um, on my mother's side of the family, it goes all the way back to the Native Americans. My great-grandmother, Bernard, used to run two wood-fired evaporators and told my great-grandfather, you stay out of the sugar house, go get me some sap. And he would take a four-horse hitch and go out and collect 800 buckets to bring her sap to keep her two evaporators going. Mm -hmm. And they too cooked it all the way down to cake sugar. She would make it into a very heavy syrup, finish it on the evaporators as far as she could, bring it to the house and make it into cakes. She'd be working on that sometimes into June and they would sell yep, they'd keep it in what they called settling cans in the cellar cuz maple syrup imparts minerals because you know what comes up out of the ground is minerals and water and the sucrose that the tree makes and so in the boiling those minerals come out and we call it sugar sand it's just the minerals that just like would accumulate on the bottom of your tea kettle after years and years of use with high mineral water it's much much higher with maple sap so filtration has to be done hot or you're not going to get it through a filter so what they did Back then was they would settle it and there would be all of the maple syrup cans had the spout so far off the bottom. Mm -hmm. And they'd put it in the cellar and add to it and add to it and add to it and then leave it sit for somewhat, sometimes upwards of a month and settle all those minerals out and then cold can it into glass sometimes, tin sometimes. This, uh, this little jug right here was made by Forty the Tinsmith in Charlemont for my grandmother Sessions on my mother's That's side. Cool yeah, and, and he made the only thing that he bought was the screw-on cap and the little threaded part. Lots of nice lead solder in these babies. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> I remember we had pint cans at one point. They were about this tall and about this wide. Do you remember those? Yes, I do. Those about yeah. that same size for in, uh, inner seals you had to push in? Yes. Chris Davenport and I compared black and blue thumbs every yeah. year because we <laughs> pushing those seals in. They would, they would split your thumbs. They yep. would be the tiniest yep. they were little smaller than that and, and you had a seal you put in and then the vacuum would pull it down yeah. and the cap just kind of kept it in place but that's how you knew that your syrup was still good is when you stuck your can opener in there you hear and you knew yeah. that it was still in good shape and the other trick was if, if syrup is cooked enough it will keep oh, and if it's not yeah. cooked enough it won't it will ferment yeah whether it's sealed or not it will not so in between the caked sugar and the maple syrup was maple cream. Now that syrup that's cooked down a little bit further, boils at about 232, 233 degrees, cooled to room temperature, and then stirred. And it's about the consistency of peanut butter. Yep. And one, if you haven't tasted it, it's one of the most decadent things you can <laughs> possibly taste. Try and it on a peanut butter sandwich. And these, yeah. these, are the, these are the tins here that we used to package maple cream in. And you could also get, I remember, ones with different paintings on them and, and an orange blossom, and it was comb honey. The mm -hmm. same exact tin mm -hmm. that my grandfather used to trade maple cream for honey mm -hmm. in the exact same size tins. He'd trade them mm -hmm. with, uh, with somebody that uh, had an apiary. So over the years, a lot has changed with maple. Um, and if you didn't change, you probably wouldn't still be doing it. I, I remember coming home from school, and it was always, oh, along about the middle of February, around Valentine's Day, a little, little after, the sun's getting strong, 
And my grandfather would grab Warren and I as we were walking by the house, and he'd say, pick up those buckets, put them in the sugar house. They'd, he'd have them out under the eaves, soaking up the water. And boy, wasn't that just so much fun to dump out a hundred or so wooden buckets and get your coat all nice and soaking wet and walk on home the rest of the way. But, but that was, that's when you knew winter was losing its grip on you and pretty quick they'd be out drilling the holes. But that was part of the spring, you know, chores that you did. It was all about men and horses in shape and well I guess even though we were only little shavers we were considered the men or something. Exactly. But it was something my grandfather Clarence Boyden, wonderful, wonderful gentleman but firm believer, very firm believer that idle hands were the devil's workshop. And I'll tell you what, we learned to look busy when grandpa's on. That's just something you learned, was to look busy. But he'd catch us, you know, we'd come walking up the road and unsuspecting, and boy, he'd come right around the corner. Oh, good, he'd say, come on over, pick up the buckets. So, um, so that's the, in, in, you know, then along the galvanized buckets, we had a few of them, and my father bought a few more, and my grandfather was boiling one Easter Sunday about 55 years ago, and the sugar house caught fire. And he figured that was his message. And he never boiled syrup on an Easter Sunday again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they shortened it up and boarded it up and used it for a few more years, but they needed definitely needed a new sugar house. And that's when my father, who kind of dragged the family kicking and streaming, screaming out of the horse era into the tractor era and whatnot, said, look, we need to put the sugar house down here. We can, we can haul the sap to it. We need to get the, we need to do more direct sales. And so that's what they did in 1966. They built the, uh, built the sugar house and it's been there ever since. But about 50 years after my grandfather's fire, we had one. Aside from the fact that we were able to save one third of the building, or two thirds of the building, basically lost the woodshed and a, a tank room, one of the absolute most humbling experiences of our life was the next morning when half of the people that I can see right here were there with shovels and wheelbarrows and Helen Baker brought down lunch and fed everybody. Three days later, I professional people, builders, electricians were down there boarding up the end of that building, rewiring it. Three days later, the sun came out, the sap started to run, and we were boiling sap again. You can't do that anywhere else than right here in Conway. And I'll tell you, I was always on the other side of that. I was always helping somebody cut wood when they broke their leg in the fall or something like that. To be on the receiving end is one of the most humble things that you can ever experience. Something but you never forget. You, uh, you absolutely do your best to pay it forward after that, I'll tell you. And uh, um, it's, just, it's just pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And so every sugar house needs a good fire every 50 years <laughs> to, make you, to, to make you modernize. And uh, we did a little bit more concrete and a little bit bigger electrical service and a little bigger evaporator. And, yeah. and uh, you know, figured, well, you know, we got things shiny, let's go a little further. And, and what we're doing now is working on making it a little easier for Gene and I to get our work done. So, um, you know, a little bit of insulation here and there and relocate the stove and stuff like that and more of a commercial kitchen with nice, really good washable walls and ceilings, that kind of stuff, because you are making a food product and even though it's pretty easy to preserve, you're still making a food product. Exactly. And Food Safety and Modernization Act is looking down everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, looking in everybody's window now. So we try to get ahead of the curve and, and uh, you know, make sure that we've got a place that people can walk into and feel good about what they're doing. And all of that comes, comes at a cost. Luckily for me, I'm a fairly handy guy and I'm able to do most of it 
most of it ourselves with the help of the family and, and whatnot. Um, and so we have now gotten away from buckets almost entirely. Some of that is due to road salt. You notice no big old maple trees beside the road now, or any that are, are die back and they're falling apart. They, they are extremely susceptible to damage from road salt. And of course, the place for sap buckets was along the roadsides where you can drive along with a team or a, a tank or whatever, a tractor and truck, and collect the sap. And it's always super sweet sap because the trees have giant crowns on them. But those days are gone. So if you want sap, you've got to go to the woods and you've got to go to the hillsides. So it, it, if you guys want to chime in at all, I, I just am going to show you basically what we go to the woods with now. <clears throat> A pack basket. <clears throat> 500 feet of tubing right here, okay? That'll connect an awful lot of trees together and tank it to one tank. What do you do with that tubing? You put all the pieces together. <laughs> Cut it up into little pieces. You got spouts. You've got end hooks. You got couplings. These you use a lot of during the season. If you've got a place where the trail goes across, quick connects. Got connectors. <laughs> All kinds of goodies. And then it goes to main lines. And then you have main line fittings. Uh, you can't just push this stuff together. Of course not. You gotta have a hundred dollar tool. <laughs> <laughs> Snap that tubing. <laughs> and push it together. We started out. We went, dad and, dad and mom went to a maple something or other. Argyle, New York. And to learn how to put up tubing, he made, dad made this little, you took a, a small paint can and you had a little rack in it. You yep. put a big paint can with holes in the bottom, you put charcoal in it. Right. Right? You carried this little thing and you boiled water along the way. Yep. And you, you know, you put your tubing yeah. in the hot water, then you push it together. So we didn't have the fancy tools. Yeah. So, and I don't have a fancy little box. I carry a hunt and fanny pack yeah. with lots of pockets. So you, you just have to keep reaching for the right pocket. The other thing you carry is a saw big enough to cut a six inch limb off the main line. Exactly. <laughs> and it saves you an awful lot of trips back for the chainsaw. But another special little tool, probably a $50 bill now, to bore a hole in the main line, to put a main line fitting in, so you can hit your laterals in. But what you do on those cold winter nights, <laughs> when you got your feet up in the recliner, is you have one of these rolls of tubing sitting next to it, and you pull off chunks about that long, <laughs> and you snip them. And you get out your one-handed tool right here, and you make drops. You just press the ends onto the drops. And, you know, in a good relaxing two hour show, you can have 125 drops. <laughs> and uh, that, that's the one time that I don't generally fall asleep in the recliner because if I do, I cut my fingertips or something because this, this one hand tool is also a tubing cutter. Uh -oh. So when you're pushing them together with that, you want to keep your fingers back. <laughs> Sounds like words of advice. So that's, uh, that's what you do. So when you do go out to, to set tubing now, people look at it and see this just myriad of tubing and spider's nest and like, how, how do they do this? You put an end hook on, you start at the bottom, you put this guy on a derailleur, put the end and you just pick as straight a line as you can that's going to take as many as 10 taps. And you go up there and you wrap around that top tree, hook this hook on. Now this hook is nicely made with a drop that you can add, add a drop onto and put a spout in. Sap comes around the tree down the hill. Pull it tight, going by all the trees, going as straight as you can. You weave and wad a little bit, but you don't do any of this this kind of, it's not laser tag. And, <laughs> and you find your way down to either the main line or the tank, and you tie it off on the end, and now the hook 
doesn't have a drop in it, but it's, it's got the part that goes down into the tank or off to the main line. <coughs> or if, if things work out good, you've got a hook coupling that hooks on the wire that's supporting the main line so you can put a loop to your connector. And then you go back later on, so you can do this as you can see all alone. It's kind of depressing, but you can. You go back later on, snap, snap onto the tubing, snip right in the middle there, open it up, take your drops that you have all made, squeeze it, and put it in place. And you can hit every tree all the way up through. And before you know it, you got 10 taps in place. Mm -hmm. And you just keep moving along. And One you know, time. in the course of a day, you can actually get quite a lot done. As long as you say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to hang some tubing. <laughs> <laughs> you never go out and say, I'm going to hang 300 taps today. Mm -hmm. Never, ever. Exactly. I'm going to hang some tubing because you never know what you're going to find when you get out there. Mm -hmm. Grape vines, down trees. Grape vines, down trees. Grape vines will kill maple trees. Boy, how they love to grow up maple trees. But there's this neat little thing we've learned. You cut them off in the month of March. Cut a little piece out so they can't touch the ground. They'll bleed to death. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to take care of wild grape vines that are killing your maple trees. Mm -hmm. And you got to catch them in the in the month of March, late February to March. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next year you come back and they'll be falling down out of the trees. And to me, it's just a wonderful sight. <laughs> Even if I trip in them, <laughs> it's all good. And so that's basically where we have come. We were forced off the sides of the roads and back to the woods. Um, I swear some of the places that we go to set sap tubing even the horses wouldn't go. <laughs> it's, it's really steep, but boy, it's, it's pretty wonderful. The, the use of mechanical vacuum is something that a lot of sugar houses have started using, have for 35, 40 years, but it's never worked really well for us because basically we don't have a big sugar bush. Burnett's have a big sugar bush. Um, kind of a challenging one, I'll say, but a big sugar bush. It's cold at Burnett's compared yes. to Boyd's. And, uh, and so all of our sap has to come gravity. So instead of using the standard 5 16 sap to maple tubing that the guys with vacuum can use, we've gone down to 3 16 And the reason for that is 3 16 the surface tension, the meniscus will hold and it won't allow an air bubble to come back up and it will actually create natural vacuum. Almost an inch of mercury per foot of drop. So anywhere where we have 30 feet of drop, we can actually have a vacuum gauge at the top pinned on 28 inches of vacuum, which is, it has been absolutely life-changing for us as far as the amount of sap per tap we get. Now one tiny little squirrel bite though, <laughs> and you lose all your vacuum. Or if you've got a loose spout, you yeah. can find it because it, yeah. it hisses. You, you've got to have people, you've got to be, your, your money is made in the woods. It's, you know, it's spent in the sugar house. Believe me, it's made in the woods. You've got to be walking your tubing all the time and looking for fast moving bubbles. You see fast moving bubbles, boy, a lot of people going by and say, whoa, look at that sap running. Not the case. What you should see is a column of sap with a little short bubble crawling along at about that speed. You see fast moving bubbles, follow them all the way back to the point and you'll find where one little tooth has gone through and broke your vacuum. Get out your two handed tool, snip, all of a sudden you're cutting your nice tubing apart, put a coupling in, but ah, everything's slowed back down and tomorrow you got a good lot of sap in the tank. You must spend time in the woods. I don't care if, even if you have mechanical vacuum, air coming in will reduce the amount of vacuum you have, but it also sucks in pathogens, yeast, and mold that's naturally in the air, and it'll degrade the quality of your sap. So natural vacuum and mechanical vacuum work very well, but you absolutely must be walking your tubing all the time. The old days of 5 16 tubing, when 
there was no vacuum on it, sure, the air would go back up and the sap would come down, but if it got a little bite in it, you'd just have a puddle on the ground, but the sap that made it to the tank would still make really good syrup. And what we found is we can actually get a lot more sap, a lot more sugar out of the tree, up to a half a pound of sugar per tap. And, you know, it's, it still must, must be walked and maintained all the time. You spend a lot of time and, on snowshoes. And, and that's what people wonder, you know, what you're doing in between boiling. <laughs> and why did Howard always take seven weeks off in, sh in, in the spring to go sugaring? <laughs> well, it wasn't for sleep, I can tell you that. And why did Howard always lose about 12 to 15 pounds? Easily. <laughs> that's why. Um, it's like boot camp, but boy, it's something I can't not do. And uh, I know Dana has mechanical vacuum, and it's always, every day. And Dana's got some extremely fancy monitoring and whatnot. He can just look at his screen there and tell us, tell him where his vacuum leaks are, but you still got to go find them and fix them. Um, somebody else. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Younger legs. Yeah. My days of climbing the hills are over. Yeah. Like I said, you spend a lot of time on snowshoes. So, you start early. As soon as you get snow, you start walking to get your legs ready. So, yeah. so Bill's... Mm -hmm. We've got a question. Yep, go ahead. Uh, can you reuse the tubing or it's new every yes. year? Yes. Oh, no. No, it, it is new every year. What we use is a new spout every year. We do throw away the spouts, and for us, that's about... For 4,000 spouts, it's about two five-gallon pails full of polycarbonate that we throw away every year. What we found was, and Debbie's records will bear this out, that if you use the same spout year after year, you build a new tubing setup, and boy, it works great the first year. Next year, 80%. Next year, 70, 60, 50. Well, what's happening is, much like us, when we get a cut and the blood starts coming out, our body reacts. Well, a tree, when a tree gets damaged, what is telling that tree to react is bacteria. It senses the bacterial action and it actually plugs the capillaries around that wound. By using a new spout every year, the trees don't know they're injured anywhere near as quickly so you don't get that reaction. Now these guys here, extremely important for people like us that use natural vacuum. This guy actually has a ball check in it. So the sap can flow out of the tree when there's pressure in the tree. But at nighttime, when the temperature goes down, that tree will actually create a vacuum. And it'll try to drink the sap back up while it's harder to do out of a 5 16ths because the air can come up. But on a 3 16ths tubing, oh boy, mm -hmm. it can suck it right back up. Mm -hmm. Check valve is an absolute must. It shuts it off. Once again, tree never gets a drink of any, anything contaminated and doesn't know, doesn't know that, it's, that it's wounded. Uh, we used to be able to go collect our sap and we'd have a barrel with say 30 taps in it and it would, we'd, we'd plan on getting 40, 45 gallons at the beginning of the season. By the end of the season, 10, 15 gallons. That's the tree reacting and plugging the capillaries. Now you can get the same amount in that barrel. It won't have as much sugar because it's getting watered down but that you can plan on the same number of gallons. And if you get there and find that it's not, you best be walking your tubing because you'll find you've got some damage. So now you can, that, those trees really, a lot of them are still running. Used to be you'd pop the taps out and the holes were dry uh, after six weeks. A lot of them now we pop them out and the trees will bleed for three or four days, even a week afterwards, bleed some sap out so that they can react and close the capillaries. What they do is they grow over the holes. Okay? They actually close them. The holes stay in, but above and below the holes and each side for about a half an inch, the capillaries are filled with a natural resin that the tree produces that is also an insecticide. 
You, that's why you don't ever see the ant colonies in the tap holes. If you see an ant colony in a tap hole, you know that you have struck some rotten wood in the tree further in because they want nothing to do with it. And that's why the insects don't bother the maple trees. They're, they're really quite wonderful uh, the way they work. And after about 10 or 11 years, a healthy tree can have another hole drilled right on top of that one and you won't even hit the one below it. So these holes here, it looks like this tree was really hit hard, but I'll tell you, over the years, that one's a half inch deep, this one's an inch and a half, that one's an inch and a quarter, that one's probably close to two inches. So they were all done at different times. This was done by somebody who used to sell me sap, and I nicknamed him Southside Johnny. Because I guarantee this was the south side of the tree, and he always wanted that fur sap. Now, I'm, I'm very happy to reach around to the north side of the tree when I'm tapping because eventually that's going to thaw out, and I'd much rather have the sap come a little bit when the sun's warm in the south side of the tree, and when they start to shut down a little, have the north side kick in and have a much more steady run throughout the season. But the, uh, the South Side Johnnies, you can tell them, they're quite often a part-time sugar maker that just sets a few buckets and every year they're on the South Side of the tree. And what they don't realize is they're getting into wood that's already been tapped and it's plugged up and the sap's not gonna flow there. So you, you learn over time to go around the tree. These holes here were 7 sixteenths of an inch. These are some of my dad drilled. These guys here, near as I can measure, are an inch and an eighth. Those are some my grandfather drilled. That was a that was a tree that was over 200 years old. And they put something like this in. Oh yeah. Yeah. And what we use now is five sixteenths, which is the size of a pencil, and get the same amount, or actually considerably more sap, in the course of the season out of them. So that's what we've learned. And the trees heal so much faster. It's much faster. They're closed over hole. almost in a season, almost always. This year, poor trees had a tough year this year. They, it was they a did. tough season. Um, you notice the leaves were small. They got that late frost when their buds were out. Ruined a lot of their first leaves. They came with a second flush of leaves and heavy mass. Maple keys everywhere. You find them in the cowls of your cars and everywhere else now. Okay, that's where all that energy that was stored, all the starch reserves and the roots that we were gonna get next spring, that went to maple keys, small leaves that couldn't photosynthesize as well. I expect the same amount of sap next year, but I don't expect anywhere near as much syrup because the trees put an awful lot of what they had in their roots and in their reserves into uh, you know, in, into just reproducing. And if you want to start a maple tree nursery, go find your best and sweetest trees this year because there'll be all these little leaves that tall, little two-leaf trees that tall. And, uh, you know, if you're really looking forward to your great-grandchildren being able to drill a hole in one, put some in and plant them. I'm actually thinking of doing that this year. I've never done that. I've always taken trees that big to transplant somewhere. But I have one real special tree that I'm thinking I might, uh, it, it gives really sweet sap and it's a strong tree and I'm thinking why not have a little nursery and maybe, you know, maybe our grandson. I, I'm, I'm tapping trees now that I, I planted with my grandfather when I was a teenager and have been for quite a while. It's about 40 years old, about a 40 year old tree. Big around as a sap bucket is chest height. And, uh, you know, there's a quote down near the river that says, Young men plant flowers, old men trees. <laughs> <laughs> but that's only because trees make us feel young. <laughs> you, know, you look at what they've seen in their lifetime, um, it's pretty amazing. I have a cute bucket story. We had fr we've all you know set buckets, throw them up over your shoulder, walk down the road. You know, we always did a family thing. You know, Dad would drill the hole, Warren would put the spout in. Um, Bill and I would put in buckets, Mom and Priscilla put on covers. Well, first off, we were setting Poland one year, and Mom fell through a ditch, snowbank and everything, right? You had to climb over the snowbank down the other side. Well, my mom was vertically challenged. <laughs> so she fell through the ditch, and she's standing there like this with her arms hanging. 
She says, I can't touch the bottom more, and said, we'll call a wrecker, and walked away. <laughs> so, but we had friends in Vermont that their kids were in college, so they said, we want to come help Sugar. So they started out, and they got all these young, strong kids. So they threw a load of buckets up over their shoulder and headed off. Well, one of them, you know how buckets spread apart? Mm -hmm. Well, this one did, and it mm -hmm. came back together, caught his earlobe. <gasps> and the Vermont kids were laughing so hard they couldn't help him. But, you know, he, the kid never picked up another sap bucket. But. <laughs> so De Debbie mentioned Vermont. Now, of course, everybody from Vermont, maple Great. syrup, oh my gosh, it's the most <laughs> wonderful stuff in the world and everything. Well, Vermonter was out collecting sap one day, and, and, and Guy from Massachusetts was collecting sap one day. Guy from Massachusetts come along, he found a dead squirrel in the bucket it had drowned in the sap. Dumped it on the ground, sloshed the bucket around a little bit, put it back on the tree. Guy from Vermont come, come by, saw it, picked it up. <laughs> I just love to tell that story, usually in the presence of Vermonters. <laughs> but that, that's something my dad used to, used to love. So, so Bill's family, uh, as he said, started the Berkshire Pioneer Maple Producers, his family and a, and a bunch of the other real first maple producers uh, started that, and then it turned out turned into mass maple producers shortly thereafter because other people in, from other counties in the state wanted to be part of it. My father was a director for Massachusetts Maple Producers, and then after he passed away, fairly shortly after he passed away in 1985, I got on the board of directors. I've been on, I've ter termed out more times than I can count now because you're allowed six years and then you gotta get back off. And, and uh, I'm a past president. And when I was the delegate for the Mass Maple Producers to the North American Maple Syrup Council, probably 15 years ago, Gene and I went to our first North American Maple Syrup Council meeting, and that's where all of the states and provinces in the world, because they're right here in the Northeast US, get together for a conference once a year. And boy, they had a trade show, they had sessions where you could listen to all the latest researchers talk about what they're doing and they had all of the equipment manufacturers there with stuff and Gene and I found that to be extremely uh, interesting and we, we gained so much every time we went, we learned from it and so one, two, three, four years ago out in, out in Duluth, Minnesota, pre, just pre-COVID, uh, they walked up to me, one of the officers walked up to me and said, hey, how would you like to get on the board of directors? And I was you know, just a little toad in the woods here, you know, we're talking with the Citadel from, from Quebec that makes, you know, 70% of the syrup in the world and whatnot, and you want me to be on your board of directors. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what does it involve? Well, you start out as vice president, and you spend two years there, and you have a few duties and some committee work and whatnot. Then you have two years as president, and then you have two years as past president. And I'm starting to think of my age and the time, and I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do this, yeah, I guess we better get started. It's a six-year commitment. So I just passed the gavel this fall as president of the North American Maple Syrup Council. And... Uh, and so it's pretty amazing. Um, it, uh, we, Gene and I make it our October vacation every year because it's hosted every year in a different state or province. And it was Massachusetts's turn to host this year. It wasn't anywhere near as much fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gene's in the back of the room now. Uh, I tell you, I said I would, I would do the trade show. And everybody's, well, do you need any help? Do you need any help? Well, no, I'll be okay. Well, Jean knew better. And she said, I'm not going to get on any committees. I'll help Howard on the trade show. Oh, my gosh. It's a good thing she did. There were more emails back and forth and this and that and calls from everybody and everywhere. At the end of the day, we hosted over 300 people. 
in Sturbridge, and this was just three weeks ago. Uh, we had 32 vendors at our trade show, a, a wonderful trade show. All the big producers were there of equipment, plus a bunch of small ones, and producers of monitoring services and whatnot. Had a great banquet. It went basically a week for those of us who had to come and do our, our work as officers of the, of the association and whatnot. And it's all behind us now, but I am so looking forward to going to Maine next year and just <laughs> enjoying the conference again because, boy, it was a lot of work. Yeah. Um, there was probably a dozen of us that really had our shoulders to the wheel for a long time. And, and uh, so one of the really cool things about this is they have a maple syrup and confections, convections contest. Now this is where the big kids come out to play. You've got everybody from all of the sending provinces and states are bringing their, bringing their product, granulated maple sugar, maple cream, maple candy, and three grades of maple syrup. And it's judged for clarity, consistency, and whatnot. If you're lucky, <coughs> You get to bring home one of these guys right here. Okay. This one here was Duluth, Minnesota, October 23, 2019, and that's when they sucked me in as a uh, <laughs> as a director of, of the North American Maple Syrup Council. That year, we took four awards. Wow. Not all first place. They put they placed three places in each category. I believe Jean has probably placed first place in her maple candy, what, four times? Yeah. Wow. International competition. I tell you. <laughs> you get one of these on the wall, you're doing pretty well. And I was so proud this year to hear Stonegate Farm, another farm yeah. from Conway, yes. pick up an award for their syrup. And uh, unfortunately, poor Dana had pneumonia and Luckily, Tom was there to accept the award for him, but nothing makes me happier than to see the great state of Massachusetts. Out of 17 awards that were given out, we got eight of them. In ah. Massachusetts. Ah. So, Gene and I have 19 all together that we've collected over the years. So, so a little toad in the woods can make a pretty big splash when they jump in the right size puddle. <laughs> Anything anybody wants to ask? About reverse osmosis. Oh, reverse osmosis. Yes, yes. Most wonderful, don't know. wonderful stuff. 1981 came along. Bill talked about that. My father had never made a thousand gallons. Always wanted to make a thousand gallons of syrup. That year, he made 2,000. We were just completely, absolutely, we, we ran out of wood, went right to the four corners of the woodshed, swept the floor, shoveled it in. That was it, done. <clears throat> Called up one of his buddies, converted the arch to oil, put a 1,000 gallon tank out in the woodshed, had it filled up, of course, oil was 75 cents a gallon, and turned on the evaporator, kept boiling. That year, he bought one of the first reverse osmosis machines. And reverse <laughs> osmosis is exactly what it says. It's basically the mechanical extraction of water molecules from any liquid. Um, it's used for desalinating seawater. Uh, that's the biggest thing in, in water purification. The only thing that passes through an RO membrane is water molecules. So basically, you take your sap and you in, increase the pressure to about 300 pounds and circulate it over the, over the face of the membranes, and water will permeate through, and you're concentrating your sap, saving yourself so much fuel. Right now, in a single pass, we can take out 70% of the water that needs to come out to make a finished gallon of syrup. Wow. Okay, so... Last year, we made just short of 1,200 gallons of syrup on 13 quart of wood. Oh. Okay, so it, it, it used to be how many quart of wood for 100 gallons? Oh, gosh, I, I, it's been so long since I've done it. 
They I used to have like 40, 40 quarter wood slabs, slab wood that we burn in the yeah. season yeah. Oh. to to make six hundred. Yeah, make six hundred yeah, gallons. Or gallons seven, or so. eight hundred. Yeah. 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 So you know, it it really it it saves saves fuel, and for people that are burning oil, it makes it so you can still be in business. Yeah. You know, you st <coughs> with roadside trees. Sap coming in at two and a half to three percent, or two and a half to three bricks. Okay, you're taking it from there to 66 bricks. Basically, it would take about a gallon, three gallons of oil to make one gallon of syrup. Well, when oil was 75 cents and syrup was 16 dollars, you could kind of do that. But now that oil is sometimes as high as 450 a gallon, you can't put three times 450 worth of fuel into your gallon of syrup and ha expect to have anything left over to put in your pocket. So you need to get rid of that water and that's, that's how we do it and just about anybody who is doing any size at all is using reverse osmosis. And uh, we're on our, our first one, the old, the old one that my father bought had a very unfortunate end in the sugar house during a deep freeze when I was away at a trade show and the power was cut to the, uh, to the heated room that it has to live in because they have to be stored wet. And it, there were pieces of it all over the room. It, it literally blew apart. So we quickly bought another one. Oh my gosh, it's like having a fire. All of a sudden you don't realize how much better the new technology is. <laughs> and uh, that now is 30 years old. And we we are this year uh, just before the season going to take delivery on one that's uh, that's going to use less electricity and probably concentrate sixty percent more sap. So you know it is worth spending the money and staying in there. Uh, the other thing that, that that we did after my dad used to make all the syrup, he'd can up whatever he had for boxes of containers. <laughs> take them to the house, and they would sell them out of the farmhouse. And when it was gone, it was gone, and the rest went into drums and went to, of all places, Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd get their check. They'd get their check. Oh, yeah, a lot of Vermont syrup is Massachusetts or Canadian or whatever. But anyway, he'd get his check, and that'd be the end of sugaring. And, and after my dad died, my partner at the time, his brother Willard, said, you know, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that sugaring is really really worth the time that, he, that, that we put into it. And boy, I tell you what, that struck fear in me because it was going to happen. So Gene started saving checks that people wrote, and we started sending out postcards along about Thanksgiving, like, you know, hey, think about us for your Christmas buying. And we started doing mail order. And now we sell 1,200 gallons of maple syrup out the door or through local, you know, all in small containers through local stores and whatnot, and not one drum of syrup goes to Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and that, well, it supports the local food economy here. We know that people like to have fresh, locally produced stuff, which is wonderful. A lot of our taps, probably 80% of our taps are owned by people here in the town of Conway. Some people as few as 10, some people as many as 600, and they allow us to use their land and tap their trees and trade for maple syrup. Everybody in this town is a, a shareholder in Boyden Brothers Maple <laughs> because you get out of the way when our trucks are coming because you know the brakes might or might not work. <laughs> and uh, you, put up, you put up with that pump running outside of your house at six o'clock in the morning because I've got, you know, I couldn't get it all last night and it ran deep into the night. And, and we really, really appreciate the fact that you let us thrash around the center of town to gather 4,000 taps, we have 32 stops. 32 stops, some as little as a barrel that's got 15 gallon in it, and some as big as a tank with 1,000, and everything in between. And it's a very unique business, business model. I don't think it's a business that can really be sold. Mm -hmm. So Gene and I are looking into what's gonna happen, you know? 
what's going to happen. And we're looking around at family members now, and we've got a couple that we think might just <laughs> might just be willing to slip in and, and do it because they're big into tradition and, uh, and seem to have maple in their veins. So I think Boyden Brothers Maple is going to be around for a while. And uh, every one of these awards, like, like Debbie said, makes her pat herself on the back because their sap comes, comes to us. Yep. And they, they tap when we tap and they shut down when we shut down. And I'll tell you what, when I'm there on a warm afternoon pumping that tank out, Debbie's out there with a garden hose to wash that sap tank out. We always before, did. Before the, yep. uh, if we emptied yep. the tank in the sugar house, we cleaned it. We yep. also had years, as long as I can remember, we had UV lights yeah. over all our tanks yep. to kill bacteria. Mm -hmm. yep. So. But I think you know, the reverse osmosis has been such a big change to the maple industry. They, they, started, they started with a, a flat pan over an open fire. And now yeah. making what Howard just talked about, the reverse osmosis. Yeah. It's just an amazing change. Yeah. We have always burned wood, and I love burning wood. But there's, there were nights that I wished we had oil. Because when you start the fire at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you, know, you milk first, and then somebody goes home and milks at night, and by midnight, it's like, okay, it's time to shut down. You've got two hours before you can leave that sugar house with wood because your, your arch is so hot. And I will not leave it until it's at least, you know, you can stick your finger in it. So everybody's like, oh, fill it up deep and, you know, let it, it'll be fine. Yeah, I've heard too many horror stories. It's like, nope, not going to happen. So five o'clock came early again the next day. So, but. After, after my dad converted to oil, he said, never cutting wood again. <laughs> and so I inherited when he passed on an oil fired evaporator and we actually even bought another one. But then we had the little guys running around and I get to thinking, you know, these guys are never going to know how to make syrup with a wood fired evaporator. Yep. And Merrill Antis' sugar house had just collapsed, had just caved in from a big old tree limb on it. So went up there and looked under and, and uh, gee, the, that arch I think could be saved. And, and I bought the arch from Merrill for $300 and brought it down. There was enough room in the sugar house, put it in right beside the oil fired one. And knowing that it isn't really easy to teach your own kids how to do something <laughs> the way you think it should be done. <laughs> I asked a very good friend of mine, Bud Lively, to come down and teach the boys how to boil on wood. He and I both boiled the same way, but just coming from Bud, it was going to be a whole lot better. And he did. He absolutely did, and he loved coming down and doing it. He and, he and his wife never had children, and it was one of the most special things for him to come down and teach those guys. And it wasn't, but a couple years later, the oil-fired one went up the road to Ashfield to another sugar house, and we've been burning wood ever since. And yeah. intended. I told the boys, I'm going to, uh, I just turned 65. I said, I'm going to be firing the evaporator when I'm 90. And they said, yeah, but we'll be lugging the syrup in for <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> yes, Bob. There was a while where, where cooking pancakes was a big part. I don't, I don't know if the yeah. Goulds were the first. You probably know the history. I don't. But, but and you know, cooking pancakes right down on Route 2 or right down on the road, Davenport's mm -hmm. up the hill. The Greg Gray's yeah. Sugar House, yeah, you know. I think, yeah, I think. Schools were the first ones. They did, the, you know, the restaurants. And and it's and, and it's going out now, and and or I, or maybe somewhere else it's coming still in. I don't know, but no, uh, it's mm. what it comes down to is this. I I have to say, Gene and I looked into it. We were like, yup, this is the next <laughs> step. We're going to take it. By golly, <laughs> Russ and Martha Davenport, bless their souls, sat us down and said, <laughs> look, guys. You really don't want to do this. <laughs> you guys like making maple syrup. If you like managing people, you want to do this. Yeah. But if you like making maple syrup, it's not about making maple syrup anymore. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, we decided, you know what, you're right. Yeah. And I have thanked them so many times. And they're yeah. long gone now, but they talked us out of, out of doing that. And... Indeed, we like making maple syrup, and we really don't like 
dealing with people complaining their pancakes are cold or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> and dealing with help. Yeah, and everything help else. Yeah. Yeah. But what's happening now uh, with a lot of these seasonal restaurants is basically the, you know, the Food Safety Act and the inspections yeah. and permitting mm -hmm. that they have to go through. It makes it prohibitive for a lot of them to be able to do that, and unless you have a five brand six weeks new of the facility. Year. Yeah. 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 You, have, you talked earlier about uh, graded, how it's graded, the maple syrup. When does it change from one grade to another? How do you how do, you do Mother that? Mother nature completely. <laughs> that's, that's completely not on us. Um, well, you have to make that yes. decision. Oh, right? oh, well, you can tell at the end of the season, for sure, when yeah. all of a sudden the syrup you're making, it, it's what we call bud flavor. And instead of feeling really nice on the tongue and having a nice strong caramelly flavor, it starts to get you in the back of the tongue a little bit. And that's what we call bud flavor. And actually, we just, North American Maple Syrup Council, this year just funded a um, grant research by a, let's see, where is it? Indiana, I believe, a college in Indiana is going to try to make a litmus test so oh, really? that you can check your sap and see if it's going to make buddy syrup and they're going to actually make test strips they're going to look into that uh, i know oh, we, interesting we funded them a, a twenty five thousand uh, dollar grant to and because it would be so nice before you waste the fuel to make it yeah. into syrup yeah. and and see that it makes crappy syrup but there is always a thing you can do with that. You can always put it in a barrel and take it to Vermont. <laughs> 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 um, I have a longer question for Bill. Bill it, it sounds like your dad was involved in, with a lot of events and marketing. I want to know also about shipping, uh, mail order, shipping, maple syrup. But yes. be before you start on that, I have a real short question for Howard. Why can't you stir the syrup when you make maple cream? You you cannot stir it until it's cooled to room yeah. temperature because it will crystallize into very large crystals. You can make maple cream out of hot syrup. But we call it hot sugar. sugar. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a grainy, it's, it's a whole different it's, consistency. It's very grainy. Cream. Um, so maple cream, you want it down to room temperature before you stir it. And that will give you the smaller crystals and, and the really nice consistency. Yeah, we always said it. Just left it overnight. Yeah. And in the morning. And then it's so stiff, you know, wouldn't stir. So mom would bring it out and she'd put it on the back of the pool pan and let the steam warm it up a little bit so at least you could stir it. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's where you bring it, bring it down as cool as possible. And sending it to, like, to how many different states or how far you ship it? We've sent it all over the country back in the, in the day. Yeah, sure. Um, we had a lot of problems. Um, Chicago. Oh, well, the boxes used to say maple syrup on them. Yeah. So it would get to the you know the place that was that had bought it, and they'd say there's no syrup in the can. Oh. There'd be an ice pick through the bottom. Oh. You know the the oh. delivery places. We had a lot of problems through Chicago. A gallon of syrup would not make it. Oh. So we got to the point we made little wood boxes that we mailed. Yeah. But you know it it has it, it has been shipped all over the country. I know Howard has sent it all over. We do we overseas. Even... To individuals. Yeah. 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 Yep. To individuals. Yep. People that you know yep. know about us or know about Howard. Again, yeah. Christmas time, people would call and say, "Hey, I want to, you know, give my brother in California." Relative. You know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So. And there was a few years we were involved with the uh, Mount Holyoke College, and they were doing a uh, gift. gift. Uh, yeah. I guess so. We yeah, got a, we got, you know, we split the split the profits yeah. off it or whatever. So it was so a, we, a we fundraiser sold, we for them. We sold a lot of syrup at that point through yep. Mount Holyoke College and sent it out to people all over the country. Yep. Um, I see some pictures and posters for parties or dinners or events. Yeah, that was we did sugar on snow. Sure that was a big snow. Big yep. draw in our operation was sugar on snow. What was it like? And it, you just take and cook the syrup down the same as like for maple cream, about two hundred thirty-two degrees. And then you just ladle it over snow. The snow would cool it and it turned to like taffy. Mm. Yeah. And real sweet and just great. And you so you ate sugar on snow, you couldn't, you couldn't eat anymore, they ate pickles. And you started over again. We used to hurry to finish up boiling at the sugar house so we could get up to Burnett's for the last plates of sugar on snow. <laughs> and, and they were just cleaning up and, and 
God bless them. They would say, oh, the Boydens, come on in. And, and they knew what we wanted. And they'd, yeah. they'd pack us up a plate of snow, and we'd get our little cups. And, and I'll tell you, that stuff would pull the fillings right out of you. <laughs> in, the, in the early years, when there weren't many producers set side the road like we were, and we were doing the sugar on snow, we had a waiting line. We had to hire police officers to direct traffic yeah. on 116. Wow. Yes. Harry Packard. Yep, Harry yeah. Packard here in town. Yeah. And wow. he would stand there. And, and we always said, what are you doing, directing everybody in here? <laughs> we used to give out a little uh, souffle cup of syrup to anybody came in the everybody came in the door. What did we do? 1600? 1700 on one Sunday. One Sunday. <laughs> we hired a guy to fill the little cups and pass them out to Graham because I wasn't old enough to do it yet. And like so. I said, that was in the day before there were a lot of maple sugar houses next to the road. Yeah. yeah, we had a guy in the sugar house one day and he's going, well, what's the difference between Vermont maple syrup and Massachusetts maple syrup? And I'm going, well, you know, Massachusetts is better. But I'm from Vermont. Well, why are you in the Massachusetts Journal? <laughs> so, and then somebody was asking about color. So I had a, a person one day, because part of my job, you know, when I wasn't firing, was explaining. And I loved, like, second, third grade kids, because they had the best questions. But this one guy came in one day, and he says, where do you add the color? And I'm like, we don't. Well, what do you mean you don't? How do you make it brown? And I said, you boil it if you take out the water. Well, I don't understand. I said, all right. Take a gallon of maple syrup, add 44 gallons of water, what color is it going to be? He says, it's going to be clear. I said, point taken. You know, let's just do it reverse. It's like, and he finally got it, but it was like he could not figure out why it changed color. Like, then, no. then you'd get the people to come in and say, why is syrup so expensive? You know, we've got trees in our yard, we can do this. <laughs> so the next year, we didn't see them. They made their own syrup. Second year they came back, they don't pay anything. <laughs> one, lady, one lady I remember, she said, well, how do I do it? So Grant told her how to do it and everything. So again, we didn't see her the next year. She came back and she says, I'll pay anything. She said, I had, she said, I did it on my electric stove, you know? And she took all the wallpaper off her house. And had to redo everything. Mighty expensive syrup. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Bill, how long was your the sugar shack going on the road by the roadside? Because I think it was closed by the time I moved here. Yeah, we started in 1953. Okay. And we our blue pan sprung a leak about 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, 10 or 11 years ago, we stopped yep. boiling there. So. But we're planning on doing some, maybe oh. not everything, but we're. Yeah. I it's so terrible because you know we'll I miss boiling. And so if I'm going and Howard's boiling, it's like, I got to stop and smell. Get your fix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing better than the smell of yeah. I mean, we know, grew syrup up being boiled in the yeah. spring. Yeah. yeah, we grew up sleeping under the counter at night because, you know, you stayed there. It was, so, always been in the sugar house. I have one question about the, the network of tubing. When I'm hiking in some woods, there's so many tubes there. I'm just saying, how do some of the animals get by without damaging it? I mean, does that happen? It happens. It, yeah. it happens, but it's not as bad as you think it's Seriously, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we, we've learned something about that. I don't know if you've been walking in any places where we put tubing now, but what we've learned is to make it so that we can raise it up the tree yeah. after we wash it in the spring. Hmm. And if you go up behind Hardig's up there now, that's one of our newest installations, and every one of them is up this high. Okay. And you, you can, except for places where there's a real hump in the ground, that has changed it so much for us. The deer used to walk along, it would be in their way, so they would chew on it until it broke and fell out of their way. Now the only deer damage we get is during the season itself, and that's still plenty. But deer, coyotes, even a moose now, and boy can a moose make a mess. <laughs> of um, but what we've learned is, it was actually one of my brother's ideas, like, let's just pull it up. And so that's the last thing we do after we wash the tubing. We go around and we pull it up, yep. just as high as we can reach on the tree. Yep. And what a difference that made for yeah. us. Ours, when we were milking, we pastured the, the maple orchard. So we always had to take it down. So we designed maps. I have a book of maps, it's like line A. It goes up here, you know, and we had aluminum tags on the trees. So in the spring, you, got, you took line A out of the garage and you had to go follow the A's up the hill and, and put it back up again. So. We always washed our tubing with a Clorox solution, but that left a salt residue on it, and the squirrels loved that. Oh, yeah. that was, that's my question. How do you clean the tubing? What, like... um, okay, I, for us, we use a portable vacuum unit 
little engine drive vacuum pump. That's the only time I have mechanical vacuum on the tubing is for washing. And we go to the bottom of the line, whether it's a main line or, or individuals, put about 15 to 20 inches of vacuum on it and send a bunch of people with great legs with <laughs> hydration packs full of warm water and sodium percarbonate, which is basically hydrogen peroxide. It breaks down to water, oxygen, and soda ash. And you get at the top and you just open up, you know, plug it onto a spout and open it up till you see it hit the next tree. Take it off, plug the spout off. You want to leave it as full as you can with this stuff because it requires, it's like OxyClean, basically requires soak time. And, uh, and then go along a little later on, pull that top one, let it drain out, done ski. And, and we have found it makes a phenomenal difference for us as far as we used to say you change your drops, change your drops every five years and you change your lateral lines every 10. And I'm thinking now, unless the forest changes a great deal, we're not gonna be changing the lateral lines out at all. We'll be patching them. Once they get to the point where they got a coupling every 10 feet, well, <laughs> they come. Yeah. But um, the drops, they're a little tough because, you know, when, they, when they're plugged, you cut the spout off, push it on here, and then you lose a half an inch of the drop every year because you cut your spout off. You can't pull it off. I defy anybody to pull that <laughs> off of Okay, that's why you have tools to put it on. So they start getting short, and you do change the drops out. Uh, but I think this method of washing, for us anyway, has really revolutionized and, and also made it so that we can keep the tubing in the woods a lot longer. Yeah. We actually do the same, but in the opposite way as Howard does. We'll start at the bottom of the line, and we've got a, a pump, and we pump it up the hill. And we'll flush out the first cap, plug up to the top, and let it flush all the, the dirty sap out and everything. And like you said, let it sit for a little bit, and then just open up the bottom and let it run out. Same process, just kind of in the opposite direction. The key is wash it. Yep. Yeah, definitely. How many people does it take to run? Depends how good you are. <laughs> for, for us, we like to have we like to have five or six live bodies around, not every day, all day, but when the sap's really running, it, it's nice to have that many. Oh. Yeah, we always had a couple gathering. Usually, mom was in the kitchen, and I was by the evaporator room, and, but again, you had to stop and milk and everything, so. Yeah. Do your family hire people for the season? We always tried to do We it. did when we were little. Yeah. When we weren't old enough. We had, you know, girls that worked doing sugar on snow with, with mom and stuff, but Later years, it was just family, so. Family and a couple of close friends yep. would come in and help us on the, on the weekends. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, we had one year, I, I woke up in the morning, I had to milk, I was grumpy. My husband complained about it, and it's like, oh well. So he came down to the sugar house. Bill was in a worse mood than I was. This was a Sunday, you know, we'd been working for three weeks already on three hours sleep. So uh, he said, I need, a, I need a paper and a magic marker. So he went out on the front door, he put a sign. Welcome to the Burnett Grump Club. <laughs> so that was fine. Um, Mom came in like an hour later, and he went out in the kitchen. He gave her this great big hug. If anybody remembers Walt, he gave the best hugs. So anyway, all the while he's hugging Mom, he's patting her on the back, right? So when, when first off, he'd ask for another piece of paper. On the back of Mom's was a sign that said, Head Grump. So it's like two hours later, somebody said to her, said, we don't think you're a grump. And she said, what are you talking about? She had no clue that sign was on her back. So we always had a lot of fun in the sugar house. Yeah. On the front door of our sugar house, it still hangs there. It says, join a happy family. Yeah. That's what my grandfather had put up there. Yeah. And we try to live by that. Yeah. Someday you want to bite someone's head off, but you smile. The customer's always right, though. You're always nice to them. <laughs> yep. you, you bite everybody else's head off. <laughs> and it's really nice when people bring you food. Yeah. It's like, when somebody brings in supper, it's like, oh, they're my best friend. Yes, yes indeed. Oh, no, we have two rules. Nobody gets hurt and everybody has, has fun. Yep. And it's got to be that way. Mm. Because it's a lot of hard work and a lot of very detail-oriented work. Yep. So you might as well have fun doing it. Any other questions? There are some maple snacks over there. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.